it doesn't really come to terms with the fact that there's more than one aim to most of our actions. And this is more fundamental in determinism that I was concerned with. Think about why you're here today. Is it just for one thing? Probably not. Uh, to kill the time before lunch, perhaps. To practice your English, perhaps. To learn something about translation, maybe. To help you get a degree, well, that's okay too. All right. Most of our actions are uh, concerned a coming together of different purposes, not all of which are clear. We also have strong unconscious or semi-conscious motivations for our, our actions. We find ourselves reading something we don't really know why. We're engaged in a conversation. What the hell for? And often there are motivations, but we have to find them. So I think it's just not enough to say, oh, you have to meet the purpose. That theory can't help us choose between two purposes, two scopoi, if you will. I want to be able to choose. I want to know why I should do this thing and not that thing. I want a good reason. It's not just enough to have this existential position. You're all free. Go out into the world, make your own decisions. As Sattva said, you choose for all of humanity. Oh, thanks very much. That really helps me a lot. No, I think our work here in a training institution, an educational institution, a place of ideas, our work should be to give you some orientation about what could be more or less valid ethically. I don't think it's true that all aims are equally laudable. There are bad people in the world. There are bad translators in the world. And some people are bad translators and bad people at the same time. So watch out. You can't just go around saying, oh, we must defend translation. We're all good. We're all professionals. We all work for good clients. Come on. The risk of Skopos theory in some versions, but particularly those that say, well, the client determines the the scopos, the purpose of the translation, and you, the translator, have to do what they say. That's the pedagogical version of scopos theory. You, you'll find that in Christiana Nort, for example. Well, that turns you into mercenaries. You know what mercenaries are? They're soldiers who go and fight for any army that pays them. Isn't that what we are, then? Mere mercenaries prepared to fight in the name of anybody who pays us enough money, and so our ethics go to the highest bidder? Perhaps, but I don't think that's a comfortable position for us to be in, professionally, at least. I must admit, years ago I edited a book by Christiana Nort. I think it was called Scopos Theories Explained, or no, Translation as a Purposeful Activity. And I said, well, Christiana, look, in the back, we'll put in some, answer some criticisms, okay? And we put in a few easy criticisms to answer, and then I, I put that one in. And she did answer it, but I can't remember what she answered. I'd still have to go back and check it, okay? It's a hard thing uh, for Scopos theorists to get around this criticism of them being ultimately, ultimately, existentially, aethical. These days, though, Translation studies is not really informed by that theory. Uh, there's far more attention being paid at the moment to various flavors of, what shall we call it, activism. This involves looking at volunteer translators and who they work for and why they work for the good of a cause and not for money. Lots of people are doing that. Our technologies enable that to be done very well these days. But it also has debates about good and bad narratives in the world and the role of translation in propagating the narratives that are undemocratic, hegemonic, and culturally imperialist, and the need or ability for translation to stimulate and equally propagate counter-narratives of uh, grassroots democracy and participation and multiculturalism. You must be familiar with these kinds of ideological arguments. 
Part of the argument is very astute. It says that most of the messages that get translated and interpreted in the world are those of the big international Western-based bodies. The people with the most money can buy the best translators and interpreters and can therefore send their messages into the most languages with the most authority and the most power. And that translation as an institution is participating in that power game. You see the risk of Skopos theory. And then many of the other messages, the subversive, the critical messages, the messages from outside of the West, don't get translated because people don't have the money to pay you or me to translate them. And so we find that there are people sending these messages, working on the translating them without being paid, and that that is becoming an important part of translation activity in the world. Okay? Um, the trouble is when you look at it in detail, the ideology is not as neat as we would like it to be. For example, if you look at the volunteer people doing fan subbing, you know what fan subbing is? You've never seen a film illegally on the internet, have you? And you might notice that if it's not in a language you know, you've got free subtitles, which can be downloaded for many languages. And most of them are done these days by interactive volunteer groups who have a lot of fun doing them. You know, work on your favorite TV series, work on your favorite film. Now, that can be presented as opposing international capitalism because it's non-official transmission. You know, your subtitles are not done by the producing company. They're done by many volunteer receiving societies, groups, active, you know, opposed the West and opposed capitalism and stuff. Okay, they do it for free and they have good fun. And the quality of the subtitles is often very, very good. That is, it's at a level of professional subtitles, at least for Spanish, the ones I've been looking at in my research group. But the content they are translating is overwhelmingly Hollywood, American TV series, blockbuster films, you know, your one hegemonic culture. Even in China, where the uh, subtitling, fan subbing activity is very much opposed by the official regime, you know, they close down a website, it springs up in another one, it springs up in another one, and so on. Even where the whole youth culture is fighting against the great Chinese firewall, the government tries to block out negative influences, what you find is that the content being translated is from hegemonic Western culture. So it's not easy to claim that um, there's a subversive counterculture operating through translation. We would like that to be the case. It's a bird. It's crying for help. Okay. Uh, but quantitatively uh, and in terms of directionality, it's a difficult argument. Uh, one of the main people to argue um, for a more activist approach to translation is Mona Baker, who has written a book called Translation and Conflict, in which she makes fun of people who go and work for, let's see, the CIA, the US State Department, anything remotely Israeli, L'Oreal, I didn't quite get that, but I think L'Oreal makes fashion products for your hair and uses bad things from animals or something. I don't know. Politically incorrect. Don't work for L'Oreal. And then Translators Without Borders, Traducteur Sans Frontières, a French-based organization, which has among its clients, that's right, L'Oreal. And so they're bad, okay? And there's, you know, painting people with this ideological brush. If you work for the baddies, therefore you're bad. Uh, big commerce is bad. The West is bad. Uh, let's oppose all of that. Uh, and Bill Baker um, says you should only work for clients with whom you have mutual respect. So don't work for these people. Good advice. 
when you're starting up your business, trying to get a foothold in the market? Well, wait a minute, I suggest. You mean we're going to have no communication with the bad guys? We're going to cut off, boycott them, send them to Coventry, you say in English. The Coventry means you don't speak to them. Okay? And that will hurt them? I don't think so. Uh, I, I face this every year. I, I have the great pleasure of seeing you here, but from September to December, I, I work in Monterey in the United States. Most of the people in front of me in the master's class there will get jobs in the CIA and the State Department and the Chinese government and all the bad guys. Okay, they're going to get their good translators and interpreters, and I'm happy that each year I get a chance to put a few ideas in these heads before they go and work for the bad guys, and they might be able to do something good within those institutions. Who knows? Okay, this is a political choice. You can have the path of boycott, non-participation. What was it? Nicht mitmachen, Adorno hat gesagt. Yeah? Don't participate with, with official culture. Create subversive culture. If you can do it, go ahead and do it. But if you can't, and if you find yourself working for these people, do some good while you're at it. Open people to alternative ideas. Open the hegemony of Western culture if you find a way to do it. Okay? I uh, personally suggest that this is a noble ethics of resistance, which is good to apply if and when you can, but for most of us, we're not economically, financially able to do that. And the ethics of dialogue can be opposed to it. It's not obvious that blocking communication solves the problem. It seems to me more often the case that dialogue can solve the problem. I hasten to add that the same person who wrote this, Mona Baker, uh, refuses to speak with Israeli academics who work on translation because of Israel's nefarious pol foreign policy in general and with regard to Palestine in particular. It becomes highly political. Uh, my personal attitude has always been to go to Israel. I talk with Israelis and when I'm there I make it known I don't agree with their foreign policy. It's obvious. None of the people I speak with do actually, even when I'm there. And I get the Israelis to pay my trip to the Palestinian University to talk there. So I like using dialogue and negotiation rather than boycott, but that's one strategy opposed to another. My technical problem with that kind of ethics is that it suggests that you are an ethical person because you have a good or bad worldview. Okay, you're with the good guys or the bad guys. And that that kind of ethical positioning in the world also conditions your profession. Now, we are individuals with our own ideas and our own personal ethics. And that could be a universal ethics. You position yourself in the world, how you do it is ultimately your concern. But a profession is not on that level, and the kinds of ethics that you use in a profession are not universal. You've got to start thinking about your choices in terms here of what translation is and the kinds of decisions that we make that nobody else makes. That is, it has to be in terms of communication and the good that communication can do. And so my work on ethics has been in the interest of what I call a regional ethics. I'm not trying to solve the problems of the whole world. I can't do that. I want a regional, that means just this part of the world, just this translation bit, an ethics that just works for this profession and need not be applied to the rest. So my thinking has been there, and I've talked about translator ethics, an ethics of that person who is a translator, not of the ethical person who also translates, but let's look at what translators do and can do and work from there. Okay? That was scopos. That was activism. 
There's a third kind of ethics kicking around in translation studies, which is an ethics of, let's say, difficulty. That's an unkind term. The French translator and scholar Antoine Berman um, made an elegiac claim that we, when translating, we should receive the other as other. L'autre en tant qu'autre. That is, you should not make the other culture or other person or other voice sound like you and your culture. You should maintain their difference and respect it. Alterity in the process of translation. And so Berman claimed translation should be à la lettre. Not meaning slavishly literal, but respectful of difference and able to manifest that difference. Now, that's a very nice ethics for philosophical and high literary texts, I'm sure. It goes back in part to what Schleiermacher called foreignizing translation, verfremdende, okay, when you similarly manifest the fact that this is a translation, that you're not reading somebody in your culture, this is from somewhere else. And that can indeed open the self to the other. In Schleiermacher, though, and that whole tradition of the German Romantics, the idea of, of the Verfremdelübersetzung, the foreignizing translation, was designed not to open yourself to the magn you know, wonderful other and cultural history. No, it was designed to build up the German language. We're talking about a romantic period when you had German-speaking states without a nation-state, and the identity was manifested in a language, not a state, that was looking for a state. And so you get this idea of Bildung, used by Bermann as well, which means the training, the education, the formation, the development of the language, and the way to do that for German translators was to borrow, notably from classical Greek, uh, but also from other languages, almost anything except French, which they spoke as well. Uh, foreign words could be in French, but the, the German syntax and modes of expression uh, could uh, borrow on Greek uh, through translation, also English through the, the translations of, of, uh, of Shakespeare. Okay. Um, so building up the self is not quite the same thing as opening to the other. Okay, it's not quite as noble. It can be a power play in the interests of the self. And I think we should see the German romantic tradition in that light. Lawrence Fanuti picks up on the Schleiermacher argument and the Bermann argument uh, in praising, in his 1995 book, resistant translations rather than fluent translations. He observes that most translations into American English and British English read fluently. A good translation is when you can pick it up and read it without pausing, and it sounds like an English speaker speaking. Uh, Venuti claims that this is part of the hegemonic, what does he call it? I don't know. Uh, closure of Anglo-American culture to cultural alterity. Okay, uh, that this is part of why Americans can't see there are other countries in the world, but they pick up translations and it sounds like an American. Therefore, everybody thinks like America. Why not? Opposed to this, Venuti proposes we should have resistant translations which manifest themselves as translations and make it hard to read. That's what, what he says, that's what I say. The obvious problem with that argument is if things are hard to read, who's going to read them? Only your cultural elites. And so you get a, a division of your culture between those that read hard texts, university professors and a few good students, and uh, the general culture which will not engage with these texts and will not change its general cultural outlook. So there's a political difficulty with this kind of ethics as well. If your purpose is to open a culture to alterity and otherness to other cultures, perhaps writing difficult translations is not 
the best solution in all cases. At least. I need some water, excuse me. There's an ambiguity here, though, because the work of Antoine Behrmann in the French tradition drew also, not just on the German Romantics, Schleiermacher, etc., but also on a particularly French uh, philosophy of dialogue, French-German, since uh, a lot of it comes from, from Martin Buber. And uh, this philosophy of dialogue starts from the proposition that the self is always formed in dialogue with another. There is no self, you and me, and then we come together, as in most models. Freud, Lacan won't help with that either. Uh, we are always forming ourselves within a dialogue with the other. Okay? And so if you go back to, to Buber's fundamental text, is it 1923, somewhere around there, uh, Ich und Du, uh, Buber says there are two primary words the first word is ich du, I thou, and the second word is ich er, or ich es, ich es, I it, okay? And that this intimate I you relation, which is the primary word for the formation of one kind of identity, is the true dialogue that one has. And the rest are relations with things. So you can follow this idea through Buber, Marcel, Levinas, and you get to the idea that ethical dialogue is with an intimate other, a you, du, uh, not z, du. Uh, and that is opposed to whatever one does with the world of things. And to treat the other as a third person is to treat them as a thing. This makes sense for translation in the work of, of Arnaud Neig, a French scholar drawing on this tradition, who proposes that an ethical translation is when you're working, and instead of saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this text, this thing mean here? You should ask, ah, what do you mean? What do you as a person mean? And that the act of translating should be an intimate dialogue with an intimate other. I admittedly, Martin Buber, when he talked about ich und du, and he talked about that primary word, his model of ethical communication was prayer. The du is your discussion with God. Okay? And it's, it's a long way from that to the act of what it happens when you're translating. But I find this a very interesting proposition. I've tried to test it. Well, we are. I have a student in Iran working on this empirically, uh, using Think Aloud protocols. People translate and speak as they do. And we're seeing how often people use a, a personal pronoun, you, as opposed to it, when they complain or when they have doubts. Uh, our finding so far is that there are very few ethical translators in the world. Uh, people don't use, they don't visualize the person. We do it sometimes, we put a text and a photo of the author next to the text to see if that stimulates personification. You think about a person rather than a thing, and it does a little bit. Uh, but what we're finding so far is that women personify women very well. Men very rarely personify anything. Personify means you take the text and you see it as a person speaking. Okay? You, you make it into a person, visually. Okay? Uh, so, psychologically, this is proving a hard thing to, to substantiate. It's nevertheless a nice idea. I like it because it takes the foreignization argument and makes it something far more human. You know, it's not an argument about what kind of text you produce. It's about how you're thinking when you produce the text. And that means that, that, that the result could be quite different according to a particular author, particular problem, particular receptor situation. And that tends to be what we find. 
Very rarely, when you analyze a translation, do you find, oh, it's all domesticating. Oh, it's all foreignizing. Very, very rarely. There's a, a far greater heterogeneity of translation solutions, and translators can opt for one attitude to the other according to each particular part of the text, and especially according to particular readerships. My problem with this ethics, the ethics of dialogue, is that it's oriented towards the past. If you ask, what do you mean, looking at a text that somebody else has written in the past, you're talking with a distant person who won't answer back. Okay, it's a dialogue with only one person speaking, if you think about it. Bit of a strange sort of dialogue, I would say. You know, people at least claim God replies occasionally, but here, you know, the authors, only when you say something disastrous and the author doesn't like it, they find out about it, that can happen. But it's not an ethics that's oriented towards the future, towards what's done with translation. So, so my only question for this ethics, and this very interesting uh, train of thought, is that let's take that on board, and turn it around and say, well, can we apply it to the future, to the use of translations, to what people do with translations after they've received it, after they get it, and they have to read it and do something with it. So, that's my review of translator ethics, such as I find it. I think what we need or what I'm looking for is an ethics that can decide between purposes, say that one is better than the other. That is regional. I'm not addressing who's good and who's bad in the world. I can't do that. I'm not qualified. It's above my pay grade, as they say. That's not elitist. It doesn't just provide difficult texts for university professors and their clever students. And it can address the future as well as the past. Now, I've tried in previous work to formulate the kind of ethics I want. Uh, that's it there. I, I think a translation should enable long-term cooperation between cultures. I, start, I, I just said, well, what do I want to happen in the world? What would I like to see happen between Israeli and Palestinian cultures? Hebrew and Arabic speaking, because it's more complex than that. What would I like to see happen in Europe with immigration in Europe? What would I like to see in the Maghreb? What would I like to see in Ukraine and Russia? Okay, it concerns more than cultures and communication, I know, but I only deal with the culture communication side of things. I would like there to be some idea of cooperation. Cooperation has a technical meaning. It means that when we interact, I win and you win. It's not like a game of football where if I win, you lose. That's a zero-sum game. Okay? Cooperation is where we interact and we both win. That's why we interact. In fact, that's why we talk and communicate, isn't it? What other reason could we have? And to do that, you have to trust the person you're interacting with. You need credibility, you need trust, I need to know about you, you need to know about me. That's why we have translation, that's why we have communication. And I can therefore build on that to say what kind of translation should take place in any particular situation. I agree, though, that that work is very vague. You know, it's very, wow, oh, cooperation, everybody cooperate. Not everybody cooperates. There's plenty of failed cooperation in the world. Not everybody trusts everybody else. There's far more intercultural mistrust than trust in the world. So, you know, it's a bit of a fantasy land um, that, I, that I'm building there. But it's trying to sketch out the goal we want to work towards rather than any description of where we are. In that line of inquiry, I have come across something that has made me think, and I want to share this with you. 
Okay? I'm just going along in the world thinking about these problems for about 30 years. It's a long time to think about the same problems and not to get a solution. It's very frustrating. And then I come along and book, hey, somebody's got a solution I've been looking for for 30 years and they didn't tell me about it. I went to the hospital, not a hospital, a clinic, a, a walk-in clinic for a checkup. What do you call that? I don't know. Ambulance. Sorry? Ambulance. Ambulance. Yeah? Okay, see. Centro de Atención Primaria, where I am. Okay. I go in there. I'm a stupid foreigner. I know that. They know that. Doesn't matter. And I have my card, and I've got to click a button to get an automatic ticket to go in and see the whatever. Yeah? And it's got to, I, sorry, I live in Spain, and this is Spanish or Catalan, I don't know. I've got to do consulta or theta. Now, consulta is consultation, and a theta is an appointment. Now, I want an appointment for a consultation. So which, which do I click? I mean, I know the languages, I think, but I don't know which of these to click, and whatever I click, it doesn't work. And I have to go up to the lady and say, I'm sorry, I don't know which one I need out of these. And then she understands my accent. She knows I don't know which one, and she hears my bad English accent in all languages. And then she tries to answer me in English, and I don't understand what she's saying, because her English is even worse than my Spanish. Okay. We get into a big mess. And, ah, oh, let me think. Yes. So then I switch to Catalan to say, oh, I really do live here, you know. Uh, es que voy una, perfecto, voy una consulta, pero una cita, una cita per consulta, yeah. Uh, she looks at me, uh, and then she switches to Spanish because it's impossible that a foreigner could speak Catalan, okay. And then I feel really insulted because she doesn't like my Catalan or she didn't realize I was trying to speak Catalan. And she feels insulted because she knew I couldn't understand her English. And we just got angry with each other, and I went away and pressed every button and got the thing. Okay. It, was a, okay, it was just a minor interaction, but we did not build up any trust. There was zero cooperation. All we did was insult each other in this interaction. This happens to me quite a lot, actually. Um, yeah. No cooperation, and, and I solved the problem some other way. Now, lesson number one. It's not about knowing the language, okay? I'm in this clinic type place. I didn't know the discourse of that particular place. I could apply my language use, previous language use to it, but unsuccessful, okay? And a lesson number two, the lack of a common language without mediation can produce friction and misunderstanding very easily with the most banal sort of interactions. You know, there was no mediation there, it was me and her, I've got a bunch of languages, she's probably got three and a half, and she thinks she knows English. No, it's not going to work. Uh, a bit of mediation could have worked. In fact, a bit of English or something else, or an explanation where the buttons were, would have helped as well. Okay? Easy to, easy to. So, that's banal. This is a very famous example. This is a guy in, in Florida, Cuban, Cuban community, Florida, United States, comes into hospital, uh, he, he, he's sort of passed out, and the family says, está intoxicado. Spanish speakers? Any Spanish speakers? He's drunk. Yeah, intoxicado. He's drunk, right? Intoxicated means drunk. All right. Now, yeah, well done. But for Cuban people, it means, ah, he has food poisoning. Intoxicado, for them, in that variety of Spanish, means he's got food poisoning. So what did the doctor do? Put him over there to sober up, and he dies. Now his problem was in his stomach, not in the alcohol. He entirely misread the situation. The, there was mediation. The interpreter made a mistake, and it cost, in the United States, millions. I mean, lots of money, because it's a litigious society. And if people can sue anybody for anything, they will. Uh, this guy died, and so the hospital had to pay out a lot of money thanks to a bad interpretation. It's a famous case. Look it up. It's all over the internet. 
This also means that in that kind of situation, it's not understanding a language, it's understanding a particular discourse, and that discourse in a particular variety of language, in this case, Cuban. You have to have that specific kind of knowledge. And without a mediator, without a qualified mediator, that could be incredibly expensive. Ah, I can't think of You know, there's an ethics of don't kill people, right? That's okay. That's like medical ethics. Do no harm. The Hippocratic Oath, first one, do no harm. Uh, Andrew Chesterman applied this to, to translators. The Hieronymic Oath, Hieronymus, Jerome, is number one, uh, do not create misunderstanding. You know, whatever you do, don't create more misunderstanding than there is, which is, is what happened here. Okay. But a, a good mediator could have solved this problem. It's also an ethics of money. I mean, you could kill someone, but it's going to cost a couple of million dollars, so better not do it. For the hospital. We're looking at that one. This led me to the concept of literacy. Literacy can mean almost anything you want it to mean. In the United States, literacy means being able to read and write English, usually. And everybody wants everybody to do that in the United States. So any government bill that says literacy gets money. And any government, any university department that has literacy gets money. So I was recently, well, last year, in uh, State University of Ohio in a macro department called Literacy. All literary studies, linguistics, all like modern languages, the whole thing. It's in a literacy department because literacy is great. Nobody could ever be against literacy. They could be against studying Russian literature or Chinese or whatever, but Literacy, you're fine. In health services, literacy has a very specific uh, sense. The degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Okay. The focus there is information and services, but Translators provide the information, okay? And I like it because it says there are two things. That the user has to be able to understand, to get access to it, huh? obtain, process, and understand. And why? So they can make decisions with it. This is a very important thing in healthcare. I don't know what you're like with your doctors and such in Austria. But in Spain, if I go and I say, this is what's wrong with me, he'll stick some things, look at that, and say, do this. And if I ask why, you know, what are the alternatives? He'll look at me, he, she, usually women, I'm sorry. She would say, ah, it's complicated. It's complicated. And I have to insist. You know, I'd like to know what's wrong with me, how do you know it's wrong with me, and if I don't do this, are there other things I can do that takes time, and they're supposed to have the whole thing done in 10 minutes. So I, I'm a problem for them, and we don't get much cooperation. But this is a view of, of the way medicine should work. We should provide information to people so they can make decisions about their own lives, about their health, or about your democracy, or about your training, or about your whatever. Okay? Uh, this I find intriguing. I note that health literacy in German, have you got it there? It's Gesundheitskompetenz. I don't think that competence, I mean competence means everything as well, okay? But this sense of competence or literacy as being able to make informed decisions is something I would like to pick up from the health domain and apply it across the board to everything that's done with translations. Can I, can I do that? Is it possible to do that? What would it mean?
Okay, so I'm just picking up the that that you know literacy in the official documents uh, comes from English in those 1991, 1998, uh, and it's the sense in which we talk about computer literacy, okay, or uh, being numerically literate, that you're able to actually do things, operate things. So it's not a completely new sense of it. Here is the literacy being used in Australia. I'm uh, just interested in what it means as a concept here. Only 33% of people born overseas, so immigrants, recent or historical, have adequate or better health literacy compared to 43% of the Australian born population. So look at this. People born in Australia, the, the experts, uh, only 43% of them have got health literacy and 33% of the immigrants. So it's not like you're in a language so you know it, you're in a culture and you're, you're perfect at it. People who are native or L1 or no, culture one experts still don't have this literacy, 43%. It just happens to be more serious for immigrants, okay, because they lack time in the country or interaction and or the language uh, needed. So uh, the figure drops to 27% who arrived in Australia in the, far, in the uh, past five years and to 26 for people whose first language is not English. But look, just making the point, it's 43% for people in the culture with language and culture and going down to 26 for recent immigrants who are learning the language. Okay? So it's not a thing about expertise existing. It's just relative knowledge of that particular system. This is important when you meet people like Eric Pickles. Have, you, have I given you Eric before? No. I am pleased to introduce you to Mr. Eric Pickles. Happy soul, isn't he? He is, uh, oh, what is he? He was. Oh, he's for government services. He's commissioned or something for government services in the United Kingdom. All right? And he knows that you shouldn't give immigrants translations. You should give me glasses, though, to read this. If you translate for immigrants, they will not learn English. What? That makes sense, doesn't it? My mum says this makes sense. Yeah. Why should we teach them? Why should we give them these services? I don't get these services. And if they get these translations, they're not going to learn English because we'll just have to use translations all the time. Hmm. Makes sense. Stopping the automatic use of translation and interpretation services into foreign languages will provide further incentives for all migrant communities to learn English. That is, we'll chop off your services, ah, and now you have to learn English. All right. What's happening here? What's going on? will promote cohesion and better community relations. And it will save money. Okay? Now, what was going on is he's worried, as a good politician, about saving money. So cut off the services and you save a lot of money. All right. That's good. I pay tax too. I'm interested in that. Okay? But is it true, one, that immigrant communities that receive translation services or interpreters don't learn the language? I'd like to see some numbers on that. And two, that if you provide mediation services, translation and interpreting together, mediation, what Sprachmittel, you lose money. Ah, ah. I've looked at a few pieces of research on this. Here's one, 2012, 3,000 patients who have limited English, this is in the United States, okay, and we compare those who receive professional interpreting at point of entry and exit with those who don't. And what do we find? Patients receiving interpretation at admission and or discharge were less likely da, 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 to be readmitted within 30 days. What does that mean? If you don't have a professional interpreter there to tell them what's happening and to tell them when they leave what they have to do, you know, take this medicine three times a day or whatever, 
come back in a week or come back in two weeks. If you don't have mediation, they do it wrong and they get sick and come back. And it costs you more money. Length of hospital stay was significantly longer and a hospital room or bed in the United States is ridiculously expensive. It works out very easily there on those numbers that providing professional interpretation in American hospitals saves a lot of money. So I want to take that and go back to Eric and say, hey Eric, look at these numbers. By providing these services, we save money. Oh. And then I can say, hey Eric, look at all these other studies as well. There are, there's lots of evidence out there, because hospitals do have to cut costs. There's lots of evidence that providing interpreters at those two points saves money for health services. Okay? It's not all in the same sense, though. Um, some studies find that if too much interpreting is provided, that is, it's provided across the board, uh, it can lose, you can lose, uh, lose money uh, just because it's expensive and also because there are delays. You have to delay an operation for the interpreter to get there or something. So it's really, it's very clear if you go through that, that the savings come from the intelligent targeted use of mediation services. Okay. The conceptual problem that we have there in the provision of services to immigrants is that translation is, seems to be the opposite of language learning. It's assumed that if you have translation, you don't have to learn a language. This is crazy. I mean, it makes sense to my mum and to you too. I mean, it makes sense as well that, that more and more people learn English. We have a lingua franca operative in, in our globalizing world, so the use of English skyrockets, okay? And it would make sense that the more people use English, the less people use translation. So we would expect translation to be going down, right? What do we find? No way. They both go up together. Uh, that the globalization, the mobility of populations is so great that we need the lingua franca solution and the translation solution. Both. That's why they both go up. It's not one goes up, one goes down. Okay. The other thing is, you look at the immigrant communities. I have a study on the Iraqi community in Melbourne. Very complete, very elaborate study. And you can see that they get the interpreting services when they arrive, when they need it for integration. You know, immediate inclusion in social services, and very quickly don't need them. They're not stupid. They learn the language. And, and in fact, the interpreters are the first wave immigrants. I mean, people who have learned English and then become the interpreters for the others. So the community is reproducing itself through the provision of interpreters in a cyclical arrangement. It's not like they get locked into just using uh, translation. In fact, the problem in, in the Islamic communities in Britain and in Australia is that women stay at home and don't move out into the wider community and tend not to learn languages, the local languages. That's a problem of uh, social habits, not a problem of providing interpreters or not. And in fact, the provision of interpreters to those women uh, will, in the best of cases, uh, enable them to move into wider social networks. Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk, a, it, seems, it seems not to be on the issue, but I just want to discuss that translation versus language learning thing. As It's a false dichotomy. The other thing that's wrong with it is that a lot of the way we learn our second languages, our adult languages, is through translating that translating is a part of language learning, unless you're a little baby, which you're not anymore, sorry. Here's a bit of research. We asked 878 teachers to rate these language teaching methods. And we'll see that in bilingual situations, Grammar translation is last, and in non-bilingual, grammar translation is second last, and everybody does communicative language teaching. Are you language teachers? 
You're probably aware of this if you are teaching English or something. It's all communicative these days. Immersion, if you like, task-based, these things at the top. Translation is bad, 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 bad. Down the bottom, all right? Which is why Eric Pickles is thinking that way. Now, we asked these countries here, where are you? You're not there, I'm sorry. Austria's not there, but other countries are. Uh, how much translation they used in class? And Finland, number one. Croatia, number three. France and Spain, four and five. Okay? These are France and Spain don't want to use translation in class. In fact, don't want to use L1. If you're learning L2, exclude L1. This is immersion, and most communicative methods go along with that. Interesting, isn't it? Okay? And then we got the uh, proficiency index, the countries uh, where students are taught English best. Country in Europe that has the highest level of English, <gasps> it's Finland. Number two, oh, it's Croatia. What? And then five and four, France and Spain. Lousy English. What does this say? The countries that use the most translation in their classes get higher scores on English tests. Hey, how could that be? All right, I'm not saying it's a cause and effect because language learning has so many other variables that, you know, it could be that in Finland, the winter nights, they've got nothing better to do than learn English. I don't know. It's, and sunny Spain, there's so much sunshine, we, nobody wants to learn English. What intrigues me, though, is number two is Germany. Why is Germany down there? How come Germany's not up where it should be? No? And, of course... When I did this, Germany was number two. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, in the language learning. There, there, there it is. Germany, very high in language learning and very low in the use of translation. And then, whoa, bloody Germans have messed up my whole argument that translation and language learning are part of the same thing. But I discovered then that in Germany, in German language teaching, all these teachers wrote to us and said, ah, we don't use translation anymore. Kein Übersetzung. Ah, not that. No, we just, we use Sprachmittlung. Mediation. Totally different thing. And, <laughs> I don't know. What is Sprachmittlung in, in German language teaching? Uh, in fact, in the European Common Reference, a document for languages, it is a general term for using your bilingual competence to convey messages through translating, interpreting, gist translation, or a text on a text. Doing anything you have to do to get a message across. Usually in a situation of dialogue, of exchange with somebody, with great uh, privilege being given to a face-to-face -face communication uh, in, a, in a triad. You know, you don't speak A, you don't speak B, somebody in the middle will help you to understand each other. That is why Germany is so low. But if you take that sense of translation and you call it communicative translation, which is what I want to do, I'm not the first, but I just want to say all translation is communicative, all translation is always being used when you acquire a language, Let's get real about it and stop this false definition. You will start to get the two occurring together. That happened when we did the study, actually. I did this study with Kirsten Malmkia at uh, Leicester University in, in the United Kingdom, and she phoned the ministry. She said, you know, we've got to bring translation back into foreign language teaching. And the people in the ministry will oh, yes, we're very keen on that. Oh, really? Why? Yes, the minister loves it. He thinks we should go back to translation, which means going back to 19th century grammar. You know, you do, you learn your grammar, then you have a translation test to see if you've acquired it. 
So translation is a test on acquisition rather than the active learning process that it can be. Um, and, then, uh, and then they said, yes, yes, but most of our teachers really, really prefer something communicative. And so Kierskin said, well, isn't translation communication? Oh, never thought about that. Okay, so if you put translation and sell it, use it as a communicative process, you might get a long way in language teaching. This interests me because when you look at data from the use of interpreters in hospitals, you find that the interpreters do give information to enable people to make decisions and teach that the pedagogical function is there in the informative translingual function. Example. Doctor, have they done an endoscope? I don't even know how to pronounce that. Endoscopy. Interpreter. Have they looked inside with a camera? What has the interpreter done? Now the patient can hear that word endoscopy. Oh, that sounds painful. Okay. And the interpreter doesn't cover over the word. She could have said endoscopia, which wouldn't help anybody. She has explained the word. The patient now knows what the term endoscopy means in English, because the English is there. Okay, it's a very simple lesson, and I didn't know what an endoscopy was, so I learned from the interpreter as well. Doctor, do you have incontinence? Do you have incontinence problems wetting? From Moharstin. Okay, so here the interpreter has given the literal version. Sounds uh, incontinence sounds bad, like infidelity or something. And then... Uh, a common language version as well. So you've got three versions. You've got the English, you've got the Spanish, and then you've got an explanation in Spanish in common. Okay? Teaching and translating at the same time. They come together. And the user can decide if they want to talk about mojarse, incontinentio, or incontinence. You can go whichever, whichever term you like. I take these from my doctoral student, Beatriz Cortabaria. Otherwise, she'll kill me if I don't say where I got it from. Okay. Uh, patient. Is she asking about where I pay taxes? It's a funny thing, isn't it, to ask me in a hospital, but money in the United States is what counts. Interpreter. Yes, where you pay taxes. Okay, here you've got a doctor present or a, a doctor or a hospital official asking a question. The interpreter does not do to and fro. The interpreter answers the question directly. Okay, the interpreter is te teaching the patient about how the hospital works. It's more efficient for them to do so. They have become a teacher. A teacher of language? No. A teacher of the particular discourse of a hospital. Oh, if she had only been there when I went into the clinic and I didn't know which button to press. Okay, put it to me in human terms. Patient, is the wound going to stop leaking? Sounds horrible, doesn't it? Leaky out. Uh, the drainage is going to get better. Same thing, the interpreter gives a direct reply. Doctor, in that case, he may have Down syndrome. Okay, here the interpreter has used the English word. Okay, to go forward with this, it's better for you to know what this means in English. Uh, in este caso, puede tener Down syndrome. Uh, but that's, that's a Spanish in the United States. But I mean, it's a pedagogical function. You, in this hospital, if it's Down syndrome, it's going to be a lifetime event. You'd better learn the English for it right away. No need to translate that one. Okay. Uh, cystic fibrosis as well, being used in Spanish. Uh, and el tap. Uh, I don't know what the tap is. I, I think it is the sigma the scan or something. Anyway, uh, they've just used the English abbreviation in Spanish. They could have turned it around, but it wouldn't help anybody. Why? Because the patient is going to have to know these English terms. 
If translation teaches, what does it teach? One, it doesn't teach languages. We've got language teachers for that. When you're translating, you learn a lot of things, but also the people who read your translations could learn a lot of things as well. We're learning semiotic resources, as Jan, Jan Blomet puts it. Not languages. People in the world, we've got all these bits of pieces of languages flying around that we use. All these bits of foreign terms we like to put in our normal discourse or we use code switching. We've got these semiotic resources. My knowledge now of what theta and consulta mean is a semiotic resource that I can deploy the next time I go there. Okay, It's not a language. That's what translation can teach and that's our view of the world I think for this kind of ethics. It would be domain-specific literacy, if you want to put a name on it. Now my question is, can we take this beyond the health, healthcare sphere? It's a big debate in the United States. Some people in court interpreting insist that the interpreter has to give exactly a literal rendition of everything that is said. You cannot show favoritism to anybody, to the accused or the witness. You have to say exactly what is said. But in California, the average Mexican in court, no, the average uh, level of schooling is grade six. And the average level of schooling for a non-Mexican is grade ten. I'm not saying people are dumb or smart but it's just how many years they've been to school, okay? And so you've got these two different levels of awareness of the world, or awareness of how a court might operate, and it's natural for the interpreter to try to help the person who needs the most help. Is it ethical to do so? The current ethics say it's unethical to do so. But the studies of what is actually done show that the interpreters do use explicitation, do add in explanations, do go to non-technical language for the people who will, will need that kind of assistance. That there is a pedagogical function operative there, even though it is technically unethical. It's also for other reasons of empathy. Um, Women tend to help women a lot. Uh, but there is one case, I don't know if we can report on, I think the war crimes tribunal in The Hague for former Yugoslavia had a series of interpreters for Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, which they regard as one language because it's basically... And it, 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 it was visible that they did not interpret the same way for the accused, who were men, as for the women, who happened to be rape victims. Logically, they were all women. These are women coming in. Ethics say you have to do it the same way, but just pure human empathy says you cannot, that you are going to help the people who need the help. And you're going to help them by teaching them, by being patient with them, and by putting your language at the register they will understand. It happened there. We couldn't report on it at the time because of secrecy. I think it can now be made public. What about all the other spheres of life? I went to the bank down the road here, Esterbank, and I had to sign up to get a contract. And I got this to read. Can you read that? No, it's eight pages long. Double column. I don't know. 6.5. I can't read that with glasses. And I won't be glad. No, no, she said, just sign here at the end. What is that? <laughs> it could have been in English, German, any language. It didn't matter. It was you know, so many texts that are thrown at us are just for our approval. All the fine print. The, the Apple contract, the Google contract. We've all signed away all copyright to anything you upload to Google, you didn't know about it, okay? Uh, there's a lot of missing literacy in the semiotic resources around us. And that's just down at the bank down the road here. 
go through, think about the documents you use in the various spheres of life and ask yourself, are people being told what the alternatives are? Do we get the information we require on which to make decisions? When you sign up for courses at a university, is that clear to you? If you go on an Erasmus exchange into another language, is it clear to you how it's going to work? Often it's not, because we, we, we get translations of the text produced for local students, but foreign students need more explanation and more help. Right through to political literacy. Knowing how to make an informed political decision is the centerpiece of any democracy. As Habermas put it, uh, citizens in a democracy should be able to view themselves jointly as authors of the laws. That is, I am partly the author of that law that controls me. That's a very, very hard thing to enact in any complex democracy. But that's the ideal we have every time we go to vote. How much actual information comes through to us about what we're voting on? At the Austrian level, perhaps, there's no translation involved. But at the European level, the European laws that do govern us, does anyone here feel jointly responsible for them, that we have jointly authored them at all? I don't. Firstly, because if the translations are available, I don't know where to find them. And if I can find them, it's very hard for me to read them. One of the problems with European political identity, quite apart from the ethics, is that nobody says they're European unless you come from outside of Europe and you want to be European. Okay? People who are European, I ask my students, what are you? And they say, I'm Catalan. Yeah, I've got very nationalistic students. Are you Spanish? Uh, yeah, if I have to be. Are you European? Uh, there's no linguistic identity for Europe. There is a translation regime. That can work, but it's not working at the moment, I think. It's not working to provide us with information, not only that gives us the choices, but that motivates us to make the choice. One of the problems of the European website, the portal, is... You go in there, you can find information. It is accessible, but you're not given any motivation to do so. There are no pictures, there are no smiling people. There's just a little flag and lots of small print. Compare it, go into the Barack Obama website or the US government website. I mean, at least they're selling their identity to people as well as giving the information, okay? So my final plea for this ethics would be not just to provide translation for information. It has to be done, yes. But also give people a reason, a motivation to use that information. Excite people. Europe in the DGT, the Director General for Translation, worked for years on these problems. People have realized that. They've set up a communication department, Director General for Communication, which is supposed to be making us all enthusiastic. Personally, I'm waiting for the results. Okay. No, that's my ethics. I think our translations should provide information that people need to make choices and give them motivation, should create aspiration. Can it decide between purposes? Yes. I can say some purposes are good, some purposes are bad, and some are even better. If you give information and aspiration, I think that's wonderful. Is it regional? Yes. It's something for communicators to do. Not just translators, but mediators across the board, and also the people who write texts in the end. Is it elitist? Quite the opposite. This kind of dialogue we have to enter into, this kind of involvement in texts, is exactly the opposite from elitism. Can it address future events? Absolutely. It doesn't look back to the past. It looks forward to what people are going to do with our communicative events. And that's nice. Thank you very much.